All right, well, without further ado then, I have a great opportunity here and a pleasure to introduce Professor Bert Tussing, who is a, a man that almost needs no, no introduction, but if you look in your program, you'll see that you have his complete bio, so I'm not gonna read that to you, but he is the Professor of Homeland Security and Homeland Defense. He's been doing this for as long as I've been at the War College, and he is, um, you know, we had General Hokins in here as a result of his connections and his reputation and the work that he's been doing across, as you heard, the 54 states and areas that he works with. But he is absolutely a known and sought after quantity to speak all over the globe. He's assembled the panel here. He's been working with an IRP that has uh, his elective program, if you will, on Homeland Defense and Homeland Security. And they're going to talk about some of the challenges that they, they have addressed and highlight some of the key research that they've been doing. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Bert Tussing. Thank you, Bert. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, one of the things, I wanted to give Greg a, a, a lot of uh, uh, credit here because when, when we first came up with the notion, when the War College first came up with the notion of a strategic land power symposium, I went to Greg and I said, Greg, if you do not have a Homeland Defense panel on this at the symposium every single year, then you're missing the boat. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of people who have signed on for the cruise just yet, but the point is we have got to get our minds around the, the, uh, the challenge that we're facing here. It is a clear and present danger to our people, and there's just not a mu enough of us who have really signed on to it. I could wake up any man or woman in this room in the middle of the night and say, what's the most important mission of the United States military? And wiping the sleep from their eyes, they would say, homeland defense. But we have not made what I refer to as the movement from intellectual to guttural. I loved being here yesterday and seeing General Flynn and seeing how engaged he was and how fervent he was about the issues of what we think of as our traditional approach to homeland defense, that being take care of, taking care of it over there if you will. But I'm, I'm afraid, folks, with the exception of, of, of some folks, like the people that we have on, on this panel today, that we haven't de developed the same degree of fervor about that initiative. We have, moved, we have not moved from the intellectual to the guttural. We don't really have it embedded as, as a portion of our psyche. I have a good friend here on the War College faculty who's worked with me on, on the study that we've been doing on, on national security emergencies. Uh, Colonel Keith Berkeypile, another Marine, which is enough in and of itself, I suppose, to recommend him, right, General Zilmer? But, but what, uh, what Keith said, which I thought was very, very poignant in our thinking, is if what you are not doing daily is connected with an issue, then you're really not involved in it, okay? At the Pentagon, every single day, what they are doing at the Pentagon, everyone who works there is tied to the national security strategy, the national military strategy, which supports it, or the national defense strategy, which comes alongside of it. And if what you're doing at the Pentagon is not associated with that, then it will not survive very long. Your program, your policy, whatever, if you cannot draw a straight line between that and that, uh, then it's not going to survive. Ladies and gentlemen, we have not approached that type of urgency uh, with Homeland Defense, and that's something that we desperately, desperately need to do because we would far rather, rather prepare than react to a, a genuine attack within the territorial confines of the United States. And with that cheery beginning, I'd, li I'd like to introduce our, our, our speakers today. The first speaker we're going to have is Major Louisa Kobrick, who is shy, demure, and, and disgustingly humble. This is what she gave me for her, for her particular, and I don't mean to, to <laughs> embarrass you, Louisa, but it was, she is a newly minted 59. Well, that's important to us because she came, sir, out of our BSAP program. You can tell by the glow. So we have that. And she's a planner for the G5 and Army North and has been there for about seven months. And she has a master's in history and taught uh, United States and Army history at, at West Point, period. Thank you very much. And that, that's about it. Well, God bless her. She has done remarkable things. She is, is Mark Lavin, who is a G5 at, at, uh, at Army North. She is his go-to representative. If he has someone speaking on the road, Louisa is the one that he wants out there. And we're going to find out why she is doing that, uh, why he has, has invested that in her. Because, and just a sidebar here for just a second, yesterday we ended the discussion by talking about setting the theater. 
But I will guarantee you that everybody's mind in here that was thinking about setting the theater, was thinking about UCOM, CENTCOM, Indopaycom, they were not talking about the theater that could be employed here within the territorial confines of the United States. So her presentation is very deliberately uh, uh, um, titled, The Theater is Not Set, Homeland Defense in, in, the, in the United States. One of the things that she's going to point out to us very, very clearly is the homeland is already being contested. And once again, intellectually, you guys have picked up on that, but really, how does that affect you? You know, how, how does that, we are under attack. Anything that was happening anywhere else in the world today, the type of operations that are being played against our infrastructure and against our people, we would say this is a probing attack, right? I mean, someone is getting ready to do something. Well, something is being done, ladies and gentlemen, and, 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 and um, Louisa is going to help us with that. And she's also going to set up putting, putting our North clearly uh, on the line here. She said, you, you want to know who's in, who's in charge of setting up the theater? The same as every other theater, the Army Service Component Command is, is in charge of setting the theater for, the, for their area of operations and within the territorial confines of the United States. Yep, that's our North. We're going to follow that one uh, by having a, a, a presentation on, a, on another very poignant issue, a very current issue uh, within the United States, and that, of course, is the Arctic. And I say within the United States with a, with a degree of... Uh, uh, trepidation again because most of us aren't thinking of that as being within the United States, but it is. And one of the things that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sarah Witt and her two partners, Colonel, uh, um, <laughs> what time, Stu Lindsay and Lieutenant Colonel Justin Pritchard, the three of whom I, I advised on this project, uh, they, they're talking about the deliberate challenges that, that are there and talking about how the military is going to have to arrange rearrange its military strategy, capabilities, and forces to defend our interests and, oh, by the way, the interests of our allies in that very, very unique environment uh, that we describe as the Arctic. Listen during her presentation to the introduction of new concepts like the Joint Arctic Operational Concept and the Joint All-Domain uh, all Arctic Capabilities. Poignant to us, the sort of thing that we think about with other theaters, but what are we thinking about with here? And then the, the last present presenter is a friend of mine, which I will refer to as the thorn among the roses today, my friend, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Jahara Matasek. Uh, it's always hard for me to say Jahara because he goes by Frankie. And I will tell you the story some, some other time. But Frankie is, is a, a, a growing national treasure. He is currently at the uh, United States Naval War College, if you all will forgive me for bringing that up. He's most recently from the United States Air Force Academy, and more importantly for us, Frankie was a charter member of the Homeland Defense Institute, NORTHCOM's think tank, if you will, for these issues that we're working with here. I had the great pleasure of working with Frankie on, on, on a, a uh, initiative they referred to as Operation Canary, where they were talking about the influence, specifically the Russian influence in their strategic communication campaign plan against some of our European allies. Uh, I was able to work with, with Frankie with, with uh, visits to Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and more recently to Sweden and Finland. But Frankie left me at home on the first, actually I was invited, I just couldn't go. Left me at home on the, uh, the first trip where a, a nation that was under a, an information campaign attack in 2014, and that nation of course was the Ukraine. So we have uh, terrific issues here. Frankie's going to talk about the socio, socio, what, help me. Socio-political information warfare. That's it. I, was going to, I would have gotten it eventually, but then we would have run out of time. The campaign that is underway even now throughout the world and within the territorial confines as well. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Louisa if she will start off with there and, uh, and wake us all, all up, please. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, first of all, to Professor Tussing for having me here. Um, it's an honor to be here among these panelists and the speakers that have preceded us. Um, and also, I want to say thank you on behalf of Mr. Tony George, who co-wrote this paper with me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here on behalf of the G5 team at Army North. Um, so just before I get into this, uh, the paper discussion, um, I wanted to let you know that this came out of an exercise that um, the G5 team hosted in December where we considered the challenges to defending the homeland through four different perspectives, 
integrated deterrence, um, supporting a forward theater, setting the theater, and um, contested force projection. Um, so my discussion today focuses on those latter two, setting the theater and contested force projection because those are so tightly interwoven. Um, so that's the background on, on what generated this discussion. And before really getting into it, there's two critical premises um, that, that we need to address bef to move forward, right? The first is, hopefully uncontested here, that, that the defense of the homeland is the national defense priority. Um, and if it is the priority, then we need to treat it as such and prioritize the planning processes and exercises that need to go into setting us up for defense. Um, and of course, as, as mentioned, it is the responsibility of the ASCC, um, Army North, to set the theater in the homeland. But if I could leave you with anything, I hope it's that everybody in this room, in the enterprise, has a stake in the homeland defense enterprise here, um, and that we all have some shared piece of this. Um, the second premise um, that's getting a little bit cliched by now, but still encounters friction, is that the homeland is not a sanctuary. As, as mentioned, I have some background in history, so I tend to approach these things from a historical perspective. And one of the common lenses to use is whether there's continuity or breaks from the past. And it's my assessment that if we look at potential future conflicts, there's really more breaks than continuities with what's preceded us. So for example, if we look at the attacks on Pearl Harbor and 9-11, certainly devastating attacks, um, but those adversaries did not have the capability to follow up or severely hold national vital interests at stake. Um, and, and so we were really able to go to forward fights in a way that, that won't be true in potential future conflicts. What's more is that potential adversaries learned from those incidents that if they give us just cause, that the United States will respond with force and more importantly with the will, the entire will of the people and the international community. And so strategic thinkers are not going to give us that just cause. And in fact, they're already operating through these non-kinetic spaces and these gray spaces to influence um, current and future uh, conflicts and situations. So uh, you know that, that means, uh, I'll, I'll hold on the historical examples there, but I'm always happy to talk more about, about the history piece. Um, but it means that our present is very different than our past. And the key takeaway there is that that means we need to think differently in our plans and preparations for potential future conflicts. So getting into setting the theater then, um, I think it was really well introduced yesterday in, in the panels and they gave us some definitions. So I just kind of briefly highlight some key takeaways from that, that setting the theater is a continuous activity um, and, and to the title of my paper here, the theater is not set. We can look at that from a, a glass half full or a glass half empty perspective, right? The half empty perspective would be that, that adversaries are already influencing um, and acting in the homeland theater to try and shape um, conditions to be favorable or advantageous to them for the present and the future, right? Um, but the, the half full perspective is that we still have time and space to operate and influence and set the theater favorably um, for ourselves. So again, it just gets back to the fact that we need to make this a priority. But where we do not act, um, we are by default ceding space to potential adversaries and they are taking advantage um, at present. Okay, so the next point that I would like to make is that Setting the theater in the homeland is inherently unique. And, and that was alluded to already a little bit. If you look at the doctrinal definitions and discussions of, of what goes into setting the theater, there's already this underlying assumption that we're talking about somewhere forward, somewhere other than here. Um, and and there's, there's reason for that based off of the previous mentioned historical examples, right? That's, that's what we've done. But we need to be setting the theater in the homeland and it comes with unique challenges and opportunities. You might assume that it would be easier to set the theater in the homeland because we're already here and we nominally own the space, um, but, but that's just not the reality. That, that uh, our very reason of existence, right, to support and defend the Constitution 
uh, explains some of the challenges that we face in setting the theater in the homeland, that we have authority limitations that we can't violate, nor would we want to, right? The point isn't to try and change policy or, or legislation, but that we need to understand those limitations so that we can exercise um, those responsibilities jointly um, and through interagency enterprises. Um, and beyond exercising with our joint and interagency uh, partners who do have those authorities and responsibilities, we also have to acknowledge um, the capabilities that reside in the civilian infrastructure and, and enterprise there that again exceeds our um, authorities to influence and defend, um, but that nevertheless we are reliant upon. And that's particularly vulnerable to um, these uh, already um, influences from potential adversaries or near, near peer competitors. Another thing that makes uh, defense of the homeland unique, um, it presents a challenge and opportunity, is our force composition. And I think that was very well set up um, by our previous speaker, right, on uh, General Hokanson on, on um, the roles of the National Guard. Um, but a lot of Army North's capabilities reside in the Guard and Reserve. And they have a wealth of knowledge and expertise in working those relationships in the joint and interagency and, and then understanding the Title 10 and 32 responsibilities and, and where one ends and another begins. Um, and so that, that expertise is invaluable. Um, that said, the fact that they are not active uh, brings with it unique challenges in terms of how we exercise and prepare for um, being activated for defense of the homeland. Um, it, it certainly brings some limitations on how we can exercise, but it also brings some concerns about uh, whether we can defend the homeland in a timely manner um, and, and what our timelines are um, for, for potential conflict or crisis. And it also ties in to um, one of our ongoing missions, right, DISCA, Defense Support to Civil Authorities, which we certainly exercise regularly or well-versed in, um, but is distinct from homeland defense. Army North's primary mission is to you know, set the theater for defense of the homeland, uh, but what we exercise is DISCA. Um, and, and that's a different kind of command structure and so we need to prioritize this homeland defense mission um, to exercise what, what it will look like when the DOD is the lead enterprise as opposed to the other um, interagency partners. And this piece also, I, I think it was mentioned in some of the discussions yesterday, ties into how things could impact you, the other forces, right, that this is going to lead to competing demands on forces because in the event that we have um, uh, potential adversaries influencing in non-kinetic ways what's going on in the homeland, they very well could trigger a DISCA type event, which means activating forces to respond in the homeland. Those forces may or may not be ones that you are relying on for your forward fight, um, or they may be ones that we were relying on for homeland defense. And if we don't exercise and stress um, these these plans, right, the TIPFIDs for competing plans, um, then we're not going to really understand how, how we can respond and effectively defend the homeland. So to kind of bring things full circle, um, setting the theater is a continuous process. But there is a point at which um, there's, there's a line of departure, right, that the things we do today can no longer influence what happens tomorrow. Um, we may be still setting the theater for what comes next or, or future conflicts and crises. But right now, while we're in competition, is the time that we have to, to influence dramatically and set the theater um, with, with minimal interference. So we need to prioritize this, um, which means joint exercises um, and interagency exercises. And you know, a key takeaway that I would like to leave you with is that without a defended homeland, right, then we have no forward fight. Um, so this means then that the homeland theater is potentially 
arguably the most important theater to set. If we can't get to the fight, then you can't win that fight, all right? Um, so there is only so much that Army North's mission in, in Homeland Defense encompasses, and that means that everything else falls within the Army enterprise, but we all have then the stake in Homeland Defense, um, and it's, this is going to be a joint effort. Setting the theater in the homeland competently and credibly is a critical step to um, successful integrated deterrence. Right? And so, uh, I, again, I would just leave you that everyone here has a role in this, and, and I look forward to the discussion that comes out of it. Thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker is, is Sarah Witt. As I said, said before, Lieutenant Colonel Witt is, is a, a student this year at the War College. She, she did extensive work with the other two gentlemen I mentioned in, in the introduction uh, with the study she's going to be talking with us about. And uh, Sarah is a guardsman. So that the, the uh, presentation uh, that began this morning is, is very, very poignant and a very important part of her, of her discussion as she will lay out in the presentation to come. Please, ma'am. Thank all right. Uh, thank you, Bert. Uh, as Louisa said, thank you all for being here today. And uh, Bert, thanks for, for asking me and inviting me uh, to be a part of the panel today. As Bert said, uh, I am Lieutenant Colonel Sarah Witt, and I am a member, a member of the Minnesota Army National Guard. Uh, Bert asked me here. Uh, we wrote our research paper for the Army War College on the Arctic. I had two other group members on my paper. Uh, they are not here, so hopefully I do us justice. Uh, as I explain kind of the process of our paper uh, and how it evolved and, and the context in which we wrote it. Uh, we were paired together uh, as we uh, showed up for the first inaugural event of the Polar Bear Club. There's a couple other Polar Bear uh, members here in the audience. That's our, our patch that we made at the bottom of the slide there as part of the uh, Arctic Environmental Security Team here at the War College. Uh, it is built as a community of interest, people to gather, uh, get together and get some awareness of of Arctic uh, issues, and we also uh, discussed um, Antarctica um, as well. But that's how we met, that's how we came together. We talked about having interest in the Arctic. Uh, my two partners there in the regular Army have significant and extensive uh, experience in Alaska. Um, I am from Minnesota, where it is not the Arctic, but it is also uh, extremely cold. And <laughs> so I have experience uh, when it comes to cold weather. And then in Minnesota, uh, we will talk about it a little bit later, but um, we participate in the National Guard Arctic Interest Council. So that's what I wanted to write my paper on. Uh, we were paired together uh, to kind of come together with this topic of defending the melting Arctic. So it ties together uh, with some of the things Louisa said too of how do we defend uh, with Alaska being part of the Arctic. But our paper covers um, the entirety of the Arctic region, uh, which again, we'll, we'll get into details about later. Um, so with that, uh, the Arctic again is an increasing topic. You'll see it more in the news. Um, when things happen like balloons over, uh, over around Alaska, ships off the shore, things like that. But it's definitely becoming more uh, popular with conversations about climate change and everything else. You'll hear about the Arctic, so hopefully the discussion of this paper uh, will pique your interest a little bit, uh, if anything. So when you hear something on the news, you're like, oh, that Arctic conversation, I remember that, and that applies to, to us in the Department of Defense. Um, so with that, uh, let's go to the next slide just to cover some quick uh, rundown of some things we're gonna cover. Uh, so we'll do a quick executive summary, uh, kind of the, if you walk away with nothing, uh, you'll come away with uh, what our findings were. Uh, then we're going to go and cover the evolution of our research question. We thought we were going to go down one path, and as we did research and started doing reading, uh, we pivoted and, and changed. So we'll cover a lot of the, the context in which we looked at for this paper. Uh, and then we're going to talk about some of the, um, we focus a lot of time on the strategies. that. That focused us a lot on where we were going uh, for this. And then obviously the meat of the paper and the purpose of this is we'll kind of cover the findings and our recommendations uh, for those findings. So let's get started uh, with the next slide and the executive summary. So our thesis is up in yellow. I will let you read that um, it is, as long as you can read that in, in, the, in the print. But we had two main areas that we were looking at for the strategic guidance. Both were published uh, by the Biden administration in October of last year. So we had some fresh strategic uh, documents to review as we were writing it. Um, and then the at the bottom of the slide there is the quick hit of seven key findings that we had 
um, which we'll discuss recommendations for uh, later on uh, during this talk. The first one being climate change. Uh, the Arctic is melting, which makes the resources and the access to the Arctic more available, which will un uh, increase competition in the Arctic region. The second and third uh, findings is that uh, the DOD Arctic strategy is old. That's from 20, 2019. So the ends, ways, and means of it do not currently align with these new strategies um, for the Arctic region. So we wanted, so we looked to take it that. Uh, Bert alluded to it. We'll talk about it some more. Um, the strategies in the Department of Defense uh, lacks the operational concept for a joint fight uh, in the Arctic uh, and our ability to um, develop capabilities to meet the operational requirements to conduct uh, operations and a fight in, in, the, in the Arctic region. Uh, the next is the Unified Command Plan of 2021. It's sufficient, it works as far as responsibilities go, but it sort of lacks um, oversight uh, and accountability to follow through with uh, the things that were talked about as far as like NORTHCOM being the Arctic advocate. We need uh, some accountability to kind of push that, push those conversations um, along. And then the next, you heard General uh, Hokanson talk about it this morning, the State Partnership Program, we'll get into that. We kind of already talked about some of the Arctic nations involved with there. And then it's been, uh, Lisa talked about it, also uh, General Hokanson, the fact that we need to increase our joint exercises as part of that being to develop our capabilities in the Arctic region is to partner uh, doing joint exercises with all components with our Arctic allies to increase that capability. So that's your quick rundown of the basic findings of our paper. Uh, if you go to the next slide, we'll talk more about how our paper evolved, what we thought we were gonna do and how it changed. The first part, uh, on the top of the slide is what our initial research question was. This is what we developed with Michelle Devlin. Dr. Devlin uh, is another professor uh, at the Army War College. And this is what we start, started off with. We thought that we were going to look at the problem from a COCOM uh, standpoint, and that if we could pick the right COCOM to be in charge of the Arctic, we were gonna solve the problem, and everything was gonna be great, and we were gonna win in the Arctic, go America. Um, turns out, uh, as we started doing the reading, uh, and started figuring stuff out, um, that the problem had a, had a deeper fundamental uh, way to look at it. And the fact that um, we looked then at the strategies and the concepts and how do we align all of those um, so that we can defend the interests in the Arctic region. So we kind of pivoted and steered away from the COCOMs. Uh, we'll talk, we talked a little bit about them, uh, but again, that was not really the, the solution. The, which COCOM was in charge of the Arctic was less relevant. Um, we kind of went, went back and more towards strategy and concepts. Uh, so what we did um, with that, again, the research methodology is all listed, uh, but we spent a lot of time doing literature review, mainly focusing on, on strategies. Uh, we did a lot on, on climate change just to see what the problems were, what we were gonna affect and what the, kind of the issues that were gonna come up in the region. Uh, we did a lot of interviews with, with um, experts in the COCOMs to kind of talk and see their angle of it and what priorities they had. We looked at their posture statements, talked to um, some of the staff uh, in those areas, spent uh, a bunch of time talking to General Eifler uh, in, in, in Alaska. And again, all that uh, came to generate our findings and recommendations. Um, so with that now, you know, how we came and got it, we're gonna go through some of the context um, that led us to change and sort of pivot our questions. So you go next slide. This is just a transition one that says we're going perfect. Uh, Nope, if you could go back one, nope, yeah. Okay, this is just a picture in the background there. Uh, that is some Minnesota Air and Army soldiers doing some skiing in Norway. <laughs> just wanna add that for some fun. Uh, you can go to the next one and we're gonna jump into some geography and climate. I don't mean to insult anyone's intelligence, but for those of you that are not familiar with the Arctic region, just gonna give out some basic, some basic information. So the Arctic Circle encompasses everything that's north of 66.56 latitude north of the equator. The bottom right hand corner is sort of a picture uh, of what is all involved and encompassed inside of the Arctic Circle. There are eight nations uh, we'll, that we'll talk about to some extent uh, later on that are uh, Arctic nations. Um, the high latitude environment of the Arctic uh, provides, uh, presents very unique challenges for the Department of Defense. Uh, it's extremely cold, obviously, uh, being in the Arctic. It has limited daylight and then uh, has difficulty with satellite angles um, to be able to communicate, which has, which has issues as well. Uh, the North Pole itself has 24 time zones, so it kind of makes the construct of time um, a, little, a little wonky when you're up in that region because you're passing through so many time zones, which can make coordinating events 
a little difficult when you don't know what time uh, you're talking about and you're moving through them so so quickly. Um, the Arctic is a very large area. Again, it covers three three COCOMs. Again, since we pivoted, I'm not going to spend that much time on the COCOM. Just know that it's a, it's complicated because there are three COCOMs. That's why we thought we had to focus on that, um, but realize that we don't. Uh, and then just to cover some basics, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole of climate change. Uh, depending on when you ask the question, who you ask the question, and where you're asking it about, you could get a different answer of how quickly the Arctic uh, is warming. But generically speaking, the consensus is that the Arctic is warming four times faster uh, than the rest of the world. So with that, uh, you're going to have reduced snow coverage, melting sea ice, permafrost is going to thaw, and you're going to have rising sea levels, which presents a whole bunch of unique challenges and opportunities, which brings us to the next slide of challenges and opportunities. So we talked about it being a harsh environment. It is, it is cold. Uh, average temperatures in the Arctic uh, are, the annual temperatures are from zero to 20 degrees. With, in the summer, uh, it's nice, it's 32 degrees. That's a Minnesota day, you can walk around in t-shirts, flip-flops, and shorts, okay? But in the winter, it's negative 40. That is very cold. Um, the ability uh, to operate in the Arctic is significantly degraded for our forces when you are operating at negative 40 degrees. Everything you do, is incredibly slow. Uh, the cold weather has significant effects on our equipment. It has an effect on metal, on rubber. Batteries no longer want to work. Liquids tend to freeze, whether it's fuel, water, whether it's in a vehicle, in a tanker, in a hose, uh, it doesn't really like the cold. And then um, don't even uh, try to use LCD screens and try to touch and make those work. Uh, but overall, the DOD as a whole um, lacks the equipment in order to properly conduct long-term operations in the Arctic. Um, measures are being taken, studies are being done. There's a recent study of soldiers in, the, in, the, in the Alaska trying out new equipment, new uh, gear uh, and clothing. So efforts are being made, but it's a slow process. Uh, we'll talk about that last part there. It's a, just, it's a low priority because there's other things going on. Uh, but we lack, we lack that capability. We're slowly getting there. Uh, having Alaska uh, forces helps the ability to test and try things out and see what works and, and what doesn't. Uh, so increased competition, a challenge and an opportunity depending on who you are and what you're looking at. Uh, the exclusive economic zones, we'll talk a little bit more later um, as part of the of UNCLOSE, the, the UN Convention on Laws of the Sea. Uh, there is increased competition for the resources that will become available uh, in the Arctic. <laughs> And uh, shipping uh, routes, there are four different shipping routes that will become available at different times as the, as the snow melts. Some of those can reduce shipping times by up to 40%, which is significantly, significant and cost, uh, will reduce you know, businesses significantly or a military to get from point A to point B. Uh, fishing grounds is a, um, a big business. Uh, Alaska itself uh, is about two-thirds of what the U.S. produces for um, seafood. And last year, it's like about a $240 billion enterprise, so it's a lot of money. Minerals are in the, in the Arctic are going to become available as uh, we can get to them, and then as they become available with ice melting. Uh, a lot of the uh, minerals that are available, I can't pronounce, but some of them that are available are things like coal, iron ore, zinc, uh, nickel and a couple um, and precious metals. So they're going to become available. It's going to be increased competition to get to them. You're going to have some competition over those uh, economic exclusion zones with countries as things become available. Um, and uh, hydrocarbon, the big one, oil and gas, uh, about 90 billion uh, barrels of oil are said to be in Alaska or in the Arctic region, not Alaska. Um, 44 billion uh, barrels of gas liquid. And then it's about 1,600 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. So that's big money business. It's, um, you know, it's power independence. There's a lot of things that will be up for competition as things start to melt uh, within the, in the Arctic. Uh, and as I stated earlier, it's kind of a low priority, the Arctic, with um, doing modernization, getting things that we need um, to no fault of the Arctic. It is a priority. We wrote a strategy about it. Um, but with threats in the Indo-Pacific and, and in Europe, it's just, it gets lower. Uh, on the priority list and precedence to get to get funding to modernize to get us ready to do it. Um, so that that's uh, the challenges and opportunities. So we're taking a look at uh, on the next slide some of the organizations um, that talk to and and do some governance uh, in the Arctic. Um, there are very few governing laws about the Arctic. Uh, we talked about the main one is UNCLOS that we talked about. 
Um, being able to have uh, your uh, 200 nautical miles outside of your shoreline is kind of yours as a nation uh, to do with kind of what you would like. Um, what has been, uh, some would argue that it's no longer, the Arctic region has been uh, under like the illusion of Arctic exceptionalism, where it's a place of peace and scientific discovery, and that the intent is that everyone keeps their political discourse and, and that away from the Arctic region. Well, some would argue that as of last year and some other times, that's kind of no longer, that illusion is gone and now it's, it's more militarized. Uh, and we'll talk about, talk about some of that. Um, so the biggest one is the Arctic Council. Uh, that is where the, is the most, uh, most pronounced, most known international forum where people get together for collaboration. Um, and, and discussion and collaboration, mostly for scientific uh, means and purposes. They have three legally binding agreements. Uh, again, it's just, it's basic stuff. It's not, um, it's not military involved. It's search and rescue, pollution preparedness, response of how to do that, um, and mostly being uh, scientific cooperation. Uh, the UN, again, we talked about that, has unclosed. NATO doesn't have an Arctic strategy and kind of stays away from um, developing that as far as we don't have all of the NATO, not all Arctic, eight Arctic nations are part of NATO. Um, obviously Russia is not going to be one and we, Finland just became it and we're working on Sweden, so soon uh, seven of the eight will be, but um, they've kind of veered, they don't have a very specific um, Arctic strategy. The Arctic Council and all those elements, the Arctic Council specifically in its mandated original document said you will not talk about security. They very, they very much wanted the Arctic Council to focus on cooperation and scientific uh, cooperation. So it does not talk about security. So what does talk about security? The next three. The Arctic Coast Guard Forum, which we specifically left out of our paper, just as a, as a disclaimer. Uh, we did not talk about the, the, about the Coast Guard. Uh, we left that out of our paper. But for the purposes of this, I want to bring it up. That's the only current military-to-military uh, -military forum that actually has open communication with Russia. Uh, the rest of them, the Arctic Security Forces Roundtable that's uh, co-chaired by the UCOM commander and the Norwegian Defense Chief uh, has kind of ceased operations with communication uh, with Russia, as does the Chief of Defense Forum. Um, and then I would be remiss if I did not mention the National Guard Arctic Interest Council, since we are part of that. Uh, basically what that is, um, is the National Guard states, mainly starting with uh, Alaska, and the northern tier states that have extreme cold weather uh, wanted to get together and have a way to talk about extreme cold weather and how to improve their Arctic um, and extreme cold weather capabilities and then work at the state and national level to kind of share lessons learned, make awareness, and, and kind of work on, work on that. So that's your international organizations. Um, everyone comes to these organizations with their national strategies in mind and what their national interests are. Uh, so if we go next to strategies. This is some uh, some Russian some Russian forces sitting up top. Some stuff snow pile. We can go to the next one. Uh, so U.S. Arctic strategies. This is kind of the bulk of where we started to pivot. So we started on the national security strategy. That's the goal there for the Arctic region. The national strategy for the Arctic region is based on four four pillars that are listed there. Uh, when you look at the DoD and the service strategies, again the DoD policy is from 2019. It is a it's outdated, not significantly, but it is outdated based on the current national strategy for the Arctic region. Each service actually has an Arctic strategy, which is great, uh, but again, uh, they predate the current strategy. And then um, each service's policy is very focused on internal operations. They do not discuss operating in a joint environment. Um, they, some of them are, are, uh, pay a lot of attention to multi-domains, they are very one service centric and they are not, they do not talk about joint operations. Um, so our look at that um, is that it needs to be addressed in a joint environment. We need the, um, the DOD to update the policy to, to reflect that. So they lack, a, a, we feel that in our paper, that they lack a common, that joint operating concept for all the services to start incorporating, to build their capabilities, to meet the requirements um, in order to do that and then to build that joint military doctrine for everyone um, to read and work on. Right now, everything is independent stovepipes of Arctic excellence. So that's a recap of the U.S. strategies and kind of where we, where we pivoted um, for our paper. And then we took a quick look at our allies' strategies. We'll just briefly touch upon this on the next slide. 
all of our allies and partners uh, generally align with our four pillars that were mentioned on the previous page. So we have a multitude of ways that we can collaborate and cooperate um, in the Arctic region. Mainly, uh, the first priority for most is the indigenous population and how to uh, include them and how to improve the lives and the livelihoods that they do have um, in the Arctic region. So that's a significant area and then a lot of it is scientific research, research as well. Uh, one of the areas of possible friction, uh, again, is what we talked about uh, in UNCLOS and those uh, ex economic exclusion zones. Uh, but again, we're all allies. Uh, we currently have a dispute with Canada. We're, we're pals, we're friends, don't really see a conflict of war like going out over that conversation. We're going to handle like civilized allied partners. But it could, in the future, prevent once uh, there becomes food scarcities and resource shortages and these resources become available, it could become a potential friction point uh, in, in the future. Okay, uh, so what about China and Russia? And the next slide, what about our, our uh, competitors? So Russia updated uh, their strategy as recently. It was on the news. Uh, they changed their strategy and removed all mention of international cooperation which all of the other Arctic nations have and, and focus on in their strategies. Um, with that, they also uh, said that they were going to, uh, they viewed the Arctic as a competitive corridor by 2035. So they're already viewing it as a region for competition uh, and, and conflict. Uh, Russia in 2020 approved $300 billion for Arctic infrastructure, which they've already started doing uh, for the military. They've started building up over a dozen of their military bases. There's a map there on the right of the different military bases uh, that they have started updating and they're modernizing their force. They've started three new military bases from scratch uh, in, in the Arctic. And then to China, they wrote a white paper in 2018 kind of detailing their ambitions for the Arctic. They call themselves a near Arctic state, even though they're not Arctic, and they work very hard to become an observer on the Arctic Council. They would like to see themselves have a, have a greater say in Arctic governance so they can kind of control because they know that those resources are there and they can kind of control the laws and governance of getting them then they have a greater opportunity to get them and then they also have the polar silk road which is an extensive of extension of the belt and road initiative taking the same tactics of, of economic and infrastructure but applied to the arctic uh, and the arctic uh, the arctic nations so that's the bulk of the and the simplified distillation of our research uh, and the context involved in it we're well, doing a quick review uh, the findings that we already talked about briefly and then what our actual recommendations were. So the next slide, the findings. These we touched upon already. We, need a, um, we found that we needed an updated DOD strategy that we need to have um, that, those operational concepts. The UCP is good, but it needs some sort of oversight in order to make accountable what, those, what the requirements in the Arctic are. We need to do more exercises and then SPP program, they're not aligned. Uh, he mentioned my state of Minnesota, became partners with Norway uh, in February when we started doing this paper. So we had to make some edits on the paper. Uh, and then we just got back from Finland uh, with the advanced regional studies where they said that they are, um, are working with Virginia. Virginia has reached out to me since that trip to Finland and reached out to try to get more involved and get into the Arctic Interest Council to get involved with that. But they're working on that partnership. And as General Hokanson mentioned, um, Sweden, you know, kind of raise their hand or like that looks great, you know, kind of let's get let's get involved and start doing that. Um, so we're working on that. That should become um, less of an issue uh, as far as the state partnership program goes for the National Guard. And then next slide, we're going to get to the recommendations, which we've kind of touched upon most of them. We need to update the DOD strategy so we can align the ends, ways and means with the strategies at the at the national level that are out there now. And then, as Bert alluded to, these are the fancy acronyms that we came up with during our whiteboard sessions in, in our group. Uh, we feel that you need to develop a joint Arctic operational concept, throw that into the JSIDS process, develop that um, so that all the services know what that means and know how to develop requirements for it. That, uh, along with that, there's the joint all domain Arctic capabilities, JDAX, which complements that so you can cover all the domains in the Arctic which it will take in order to uh, achieve that integrated deterrence that we're looking for. Uh, with that, the, what we did keep for combatant commands uh, in, our, in this paper is the fact that they, once we develop these concepts, is that we need to update all the old plans that are out there so that we can actually um, figure out what the requirements are and then we can build those capabilities to meet those requirements. 
So we need to update those O plans. We already talked about the state partnership. And then again, I'm gonna stay away from the command and control structure. We kind of stayed apart from that. Alaska, the 11th Airborne Division is a, is a division of, of many masters and many commands. Uh, we, again, we kind of pivoted our paper away from that and focused more on, on the concepts and, and the strategies. But those are our recommendations with that. I know I went a little long, but that's, uh, that sums up our Arctic paper. You were fine, ma'am. Thank you very much. <laughs> Something I would recommend to all of you is that um, Frankie is, is, is a, he's a prolific writer. He has he has published now in over 80 articles in, in uh, uh, peer-reviewed uh, uh, journals and, and other documents. And he's he and, and and a colleague wrote a new book called Old and New Battle Spaces. And at that point, and, and the function, the the uh, direction of the book is to show the, how certain members of our adversarial community particularly, let's, let's be honest, uh, China, have gone about weaponizing every function of our society. And one of the things that come out of, uh, comes out of that, of course, is that we have all become uh, very undeliberately combatants, all of us, in, in the, the battle that is occurring. Uh, and with that as an introduction, Frankie, let me let you go from there, please. Thanks, Bert. Uh, so I wanted to start real quick with um, drawing lessons from Ukraine. Uh, and I know it may seem kind of counterintuitive, but um, in your respective jobs, as you think about the projection of land power, uh, and that even includes even having to project it inside the U.S., you know, Ukraine is approximately about the size of Texas, and yet it is very difficult to conquer both locations. Now, speaking to that point, uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to point out something real quick. So. I'm talking more about influence operations today and the cyber domain. And in that context, what I mean is uh, up there, I, I threw up a, a, a recent report of pro-Ukrainian hackers basically targeting Russian government intelligence and military officials and basically draining their bank accounts. Now, in a potential future conflict or crisis with the U.S., it's not so much that anti-American hackers could do that to service members, other people of the government, but if they could create the illusion or the fear of something like that happening or being doxxed. Uh, for those who don't know what it means of getting doxxed, it means uh, people figure out your personal information, your, your phone number, your address, and they post it online and, and encourage people to basically email you and text you and call you and harass you. Uh, the reason why I point this out is because also pro-Ukrainian hackers are doing the exact same thing to the Russian military. Uh, most recently, if you didn't hear, uh, this one NGO in Ukraine, they call themselves an NGO, but uh, they're called Inform Napalm. They socially engineered their way into a Russian Air Force squadron and convinced the unit to take pictures of all the wives in front of their airplanes with their names and service dress codes of all the pilots of the unit. I bring this up again because it's not so much that sort of direct action, it's more the indirect effect it will have on your command, your forces, and your confidence in your military leadership. Part of me having been in the Air Force over 15 years makes me feel like in one hand, we, we would find a way to be resilient in a future conflict where something like that were to maybe happen to one of our units, but reflexively, I am aware of how quick leadership sometimes is to relieve people of command for a loss of confidence in command if something like that were to happen in a, a true uh, conflict or crisis. So I bring that up because most of my presentation today is more about uh, having that mindset to realize it's not so much the direct action, it's more of the indirect consequence of these actions. Next slide, please. So I wanted to point out here that we take this for granted, the fact that the average American actually views essentially the cyber domain issues and threats by adversaries as their number one concern. Uh, the reason why I bring this up is because in one sense, in the US military, uh, should we not be taking a cue in that sense of uh, having a, a mindset to the American homeland as to what Americans perceive as a real and legitimate threat to their way of life. 
Next slide. Now, for those of you that have seen Moneyball, unfortunately, sometimes uh, we end up being on the, the 50 feet of crap side when it comes to thinking about Homeland Defense, and especially the cyber domain and information operations. Next slide. So when you think about how interconnected the world is at this point, the fact that 86% of humans around the world now have access to the internet, that is fundamentally different than 20 years ago when less than 10% of the world was able to get on the internet. It, this is fundamentally changing the way we interact, we function, we operate. I like to think of it almost as if the Gutenberg press, you know, it was invented in the late 1400s, it really did not get mainstreamed and, and, and fully sort of integrated into the way a society's operated into like the late 1700s, early 1800s. So we think about, you know, uptake and adaptation and its impl implementation and ease and cheapness of use. Uh, we basically have seen this happen, a process that took hundreds of years has basically happened in about 20-ish years or so. That is a fundamental uh, transformation of the way we interpret data, information, and our understanding of the world, and also networks, and just the, the way you can s sort of interpret the world. Other things that I think is also important to realize is, uh, as you can see up there, the Chinese and Russians are investing very, very heavily in this because it is an asymmetric advantage. Uh, mm -hmm. And FBI director recently claimed uh, last week that China has a 50 to one ratio of people that sort of do cyber and influence operations compared to the US. That is a incredibly different scale than I think we've ever actually encountered. Uh, obviously TikTok is becoming an issue because it was used more than Google in 2021. Again, this is a fundamental transformation of the way people perceive the world and the way they interact uh, and also the way adversaries look at how they can shape and influence the US. And as Bert nicely pointed out, everyone is, is, being, is being turned into a combatant. Everything can and will be weaponized in a way that you, again, did not think or consider 20 years ago. Next slide. So one of the terms I've increasingly moved towards is this term of socio-political information warfare, and it's basically a blending of every sort of element of society that can be turned into a cleavage. And in that sense, uh, again, this is something that was just so much hard to do in the industrial age. Um, and when you think about how quickly Russia in 2014 was able to own and dominate the information space, it's quite telling that within a month of the invasion and annexation of Crimea, National Geographic actually updated their maps to reflect Crimea as being a part of, of Russia. Why was that? Again, they managed to own the information space and create the, I guess you could say, digital construction of reality to reflect that this was their territory now and there's no room for discussion. Next slide. Uh, it goes without saying how much the Russians and Chinese uh, did really push a lot of narratives on the American public, whether, you know, if there was an RF, RFID chip in the vaccine or all the other bad things that would happen to you. A lot of Americans died unnecessarily because of influence and shaping operations. This is a direct kinetic outcome of these indirect actions taken through the cyber domain. Next slide. It also goes without saying as, you know, once you return back to your, your bases and homes after this uh, fantastic uh, symposium, is thinking about your organization, your institutions, are you set up for the industrial age or are you set up for the digital age? And I mean this in the sense that if you do not reconsider the way you're doing business in your shop or in your MOS, AFSC, then you are not fully taking advantage of opportunities, but also not fully understanding the way you can be resilient against adversarial attacks. One such big concern I, I have now is that it is so much easier to attack 
American civil society, our, our ideals, our values, our belief systems in ways that, again, were not possible in the industrial age. And that also takes me to this term that you've probably never seen before, schismogenesis. Um, if you're really into it, you can check it out. Uh, an OSS agent from the 1930s, early 1940s, named Gregory Bateson, he was an anthropologist, basically discovered that in some parts of the Asia Pacific, he could actually uh, do more harm uh, to Japanese occupiers in certain islands by turning society against the Japanese as opposed to having to fight them. And it's, it's very telling if you go back and read some of the work he did. Uh, this is almost the exact same sort of TTPs that the Chinese and Russians are employing to this day now. And that takes me to sort of like my, my final conclusion on this idea of a civil society as a new battle space, which is uh, we always you know, think of, of the movie Red Dawn when it comes to think about America being occupied. But I would contend to you, we are occupied. It's just a digital occupation. What does that mean? It means that when your kids or your, you know, your, your crazy aunt or uncle go on social media and share some you know, viral meme or something that is disparaging, th their choice in deciding to share that or like that um, or forward on to their friends, you are actually making yourself a combatant in that. And I would actually even argue by virtue of you deciding not to click like or other things like that, you are also still also being a combatant because you are choosing to not engage in influence operations, but you are still, by virtue of not participating, you still are a combatant. And this is a, a major paradigm shift that I do not think uh, our political leadership has truly conveyed to the American public. Next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to use this as sort of as, as a primer uh, to the events around uh, the Chinese balloon incident. Next slide. So as you probably remember, uh, it, was, it became a really big deal. But what I think, again, when I talk about the direct action versus the indirect action consequence, the amount of partisan bickering over this and so social media debate about American airspace and sovereignty being violated by the Chinese I wasn't so much worried about that. I was, I was more concerned about sort of the indirect actions. And again, when you start looking at this event, and if your organization has any sort of impact or thinking on homeland defense, you should be looking at events like this as to teasing out how you might respond to a future crisis and how you can alter your TTPs for uh, releasing information in a timely manner and making it very transparent, but also preventing an adversary from trying to turn this into a divisive issue. Again, going back to that concept of schismogenesis and trying to create societal divisions. Funny aside to this, next slide. I kid you not, within five minutes of that balloon being shot down, I actually got an email from the Chinese. If you've never heard of this thing, it's their high-tech talent program. They found my email at the Naval War College and invited me out, obviously, <laughs> this is one of those, again, threats you don't realize is actually happening every day. I, I've talked to a lot of like my civilian professor friends. They tell me they get emails like this all the time from Chinese officials basically promising them, you know, business class flights to China, wine and dine them, five star hotels, because you have a PhD and they're hoping to get something out of you. Again, this is a real insidious threat. Uh, and again, it only takes one in a thousand people to be an idiot and say, yes, I'll do this. But also think of the gall. They emailed me, and I'm an active duty Air Force officer at the Naval War College. Next slide. Did you answer it? I did not answer it. <laughs> <laughs> it was tempting, though. <laughs> he forwarded it to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, before I kind of briefly touch on a couple of those uh, bullet points on the slide, a few of you may actually recognize that diagram on the right. And you, if you have not, uh, I will point out I added a bubble to that, and it's that yellow bubble of networks. And this takes me back to Ukraine. 
it is really surprising to me how much private networks, also in, in DOD speak, we call it BroCon, uh, how much is happening in the Ukraine war in terms of coordinating activities through uh, private message groups and sort of informal networks to achieve certain battlefield effects. Uh, I bring this up because we actually have a template for this already, and you may have not ha actually realized this. And again, this requires probably some of your organization to probably do a in-depth case study. And that is the, uh, the evacuation of, of Kubel Airport, uh, also known as the Digital Dunkirk. Uh, some also called it Task Force Pineapple. I, again, I bring that up because uh, in a lot of my interviews since the February 22 uh, invasion, many of the informal networks and private message groups that were created in the chaos of August of 21 are the exact same organizations and informal networks that were activated uh, in the invasion of February 2022. Why are these informal networks important? Uh, it's a way to relay instant information without the typical going through SIPR and other sort of official formal channels. It's also an important coordination mechanism. Uh, and in a future crisis, if you have not looked at both of these events and how you can use it to shape and inform the way you operate, you are not understanding the digital age. Next slide. There we go. Um, <clears throat> couple of, of, of high points. Uh, last year, uh, the paper that, that we had here was basically uh, Fort Supports. Um, I want to reiterate that when you are red teaming the idea of projecting American land power, air power, naval power, either domestically, regionally, internationally, in a future crisis or conflict, an adversary will not let you do it as easily as you think you will. Uh, that could be things as simple as taking down the radar infrastructure, um, Honestly, uh, if there's any, any pilots in here, um, if you probably remember about six months ago, the NOTAMS system for the FAA went down. What is that? Notice is the airman. These are basically things that tell you, hey, the runway at this airport may be not operable, or you know, there may be an unlit tower 500 feet from like, the runway. That literally stopped all air operations across the US for about four to six hours. Things like that that seem simple and sort of not important uh, because if it's not a, a cloudy day, you can just take off and not worry about things like that. But little things like that, finding like those critical nodes that can actually interrupt your ability to do operations and project power is in, in many cases, I think, um, taken for granted. Um, for that next bullet about national defense courses for the private sector. This is actually something that Bert and I actually picked up and learned when we were in Finland, because in Finland, they take the idea of defending their homeland very seriously, and it means educating and informing uh, many of their elites, but also people that run NGOs and various companies at the national, regional, and local levels. Another concept that also actually came out of our trip, and I was actually in Sweden with Bert, is this idea of digital resilience. Swedish National Defense University has this fantastic book on resilience and these ideas of how to uh, handle a crisis, a war, et cetera. It's a, it's a super, super fat, thick book. And the one thing that I actually got out of it was the fact that we have this great World War II model of societal resilience in dealing with a war or a crisis, and yet we don't have any playbook yet for digital resilience. And that means, again, having to think through when you don't have the cyber domain easily accessible or it's degraded or disrupted or denied, how can you function or operate as a, as a person at the individual level, but how can you function or operate in a job? I mean. Not to throw my wife under the bus here, but she literally cannot get around town without, <laughs> without our GPS on her phone. Like, it's things like that, again, we take for granted 
that actually has an impact on day-to-day on -day operations of American society. Um, real briefly, um, the protection of individual citizens, um, it is quite often for the Russians and Chinese when they identify a person as um, interrupting their ability to conduct influence operations in a certain country that they will individually target and harass that person. And again, there's very little uh, in, in legal authorities to actually protect these people. And it's, again, it's one of these things that we need to actually, again, transition to a, a digital age understanding of, of, of laws and things of that nature. Uh, again, I think it's, it's, got, it's gotten pretty cliche at this point. We have to foster public-private national security partnerships. That goes without a saying. And you know, for those that know people in DISCA, that's what they do. Um, also goes without saying, hyper-partisanship. Serious, serious threat to the way we do business and think about national security and projecting American power. Uh, one thing that we can take from our NATO friends, and again, uh, that was also from our trip to the Baltics, uh, strategic communication. Now, in the DOD, we legally cannot do this because it's a blending of, of a public affairs officer and an information warfare officer. But being aware that many NATO countries have this in their organizational a structure across their MODs and also their own individual government agencies. This again is, is a, a potential way we could learn to adapt some of our institutions and processes to learn how decisions need to be shaped properly in the information space so that the Russians and Chinese and other uh, nefarious actors do not turn this into another point of, of leverage. Uh, when it comes to banning TikTok, and future platforms. Uh, I think this is a very contentious issue because in a future crisis, um, the Chinese would be foolish to not use TikTok to their advantage. And the fact that they haven't, and, and obviously like the TikTok CEO says, we haven't done this, there's no evidence of this. Again, it would be foolish to think that the Chinese would not use this as a tool for potential a shaping of the American population. So for example, if we're thinking of, of like a potential crisis in Taiwan, that may be a concerted TikTok effort to uh, conceal what might be going on in Taiwan in a potential crisis, but it might also be trying to generate the narrative in the American public that Taiwan is not worth fighting or dying for. And, and that's just a stone cold fact. Uh, and finally, and I think this again goes back to everyone is becoming a combatant, everything's becoming weaponized. I'm also very, very, very concerned about uh, the way deep fakes uh, are going to continue getting better and better uh, in ways that will really make it difficult in a, a crisis, again, for people that have enough access to, to technology and money to be able to spread images and videos that look 100% real to create the perception of something happening or not happening. So with that said, I can cede the floor to my awesome friend, Bert. Thanks very much, Frankie, appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, there's a lot of uh, grist there for us, for us to begin with. I'd like to open up uh, uh, questions, uh, if we could. And, and if I will, I'll, I'll take the, uh, the, the moderator's um, uh, pro prerogative of, of opening up with the first question. I'm, gonna, I'm going to, if I could please, address it to Louisa. L Louisa, you, you, you talked about something which, which basically approached a, a, a declaration for a whole of nation requirement for, for setting the, uh, the theater. Can you give us an idea of where you see uh, the, the, what, what Frankie was, was referring to as the public-private sector partnership and bringing that sort of thing uh, about. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, to your point, spot on that that we are talking about defense of the homeland does require a whole of government effort, um, and and at Army North, you know, we're we're working on bringing in partners to our exercises, um, and I would say at this point, it's still piecemeal, um, getting, getting some of these uh, agencies involved, though, though they're very active. Um, but what we really need to see is um, some of these other government 
agencies conducting their own exercises, right? They don't exercise the way that we do, and so they're not prepared for the ongoing um, defense of the homeland in this competition space where it's, it's really homeland security um, at that point, right, before, before we cross that threshold into homeland defense. Um, and, and they're not testing and exercising in the way that, that we would like to see them to make this transition seamless. Um, so there's a lot of ground to cover in terms of bringing all of these agencies together consistently, and it's going to have to happen most likely at, at higher levels than, than Army North can, can conduct, um, but certainly we're, we're working to do what we can with that. Luis, if I can, on that, um, anything, any discussions, thoughts about a Goldwater Nichols like vehicle to bring about that coordination that might be necessary in the future? So that's probably speaking a little bit beyond uh, my abilities there. Um, I, I don't think that anybody at, at Army North is thinking in those terms. I think really we're focused more on um, within the parameters that we have, how do we exercise this um, rather than trying to, to change policy. Um, but I wouldn't preclude that, that that might be an outcome of some of these exercises. As we continue to stress these systems, then, then we'll generate, you know, the evidence that we need to push through HQDA and DOD um, higher, and, and, and that could be a potential outcome for sure. General Zillman, if, if I might pick up on that a little bit, we, we have been conducting a study at the War College over the last couple of years about preparing for national security emergencies, uh, not only in terms of catastrophic natural uh, disasters, but also the, the quintessential human, uh, I'm sorry, I said disaster, I meant catastrophe, and the, the, there's a difference in the, in the terminology, but the quintessential human uh, catastrophe of, of war within the territorial confines. And you bring up a very good point, and it's been touched upon in, in several, of the several of the different panels. We, we are blessed, um, and this, this whole body is representative of it, we are blessed in the United States military and by the fact that our, our government and our society has, has bestowed upon us a notion that if we want to prepare you for the next level of leadership, then we need to educate you towards those ends. And therefore, people uh, like those all around us here have two or three times in the course of their career had the American public say, I'm going to put you aside for 10 months at a time so that you can prepare yourself beyond the tactical to the operational, beyond the operational to the strategic, and beyond just the military strategic to the, the, the whole of government approach to uh, a, a building first and then adapting to our strategies that is necessary. No one else does that. No one else uh, 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 has the assets, the resources, the commitment to do that sort of thing. And it shows up very, the most immediately in our, in our thinking, and this came out in the study, most immediately in, in our thinking towards how we plan for things. No one goes through the agony of the, the, the deliberate planning process that we do because we know the importance and the, and frankly, the consequences of not doing that, that sort of planning. So there are entities that, that are out there like that, out there right now, who recognize it. It was brought up uh, yesterday in, in one of the panel presentations. The, the movement that FEMA has taken over time to try to get better in that area and, and the way that we have worked with FEMA to get them ready for that. But the same sort of, sort of thing needs to take place as we look at trying to come together as a people, first as a government framing our people's movements, and then uh, beyond that to, to the society itself becoming a part of, of that movement and, and to preparing for, preparing for, and then if necessary responding to the sort of devastating con consequences of a catastrophic event, once again, either natural or man-made. So your question, I think, is on the mark. Getting the rest of the government to, getting our people to be willing to make that sort of commitment and, and, and investment in the human capital of the rest of our government uh, is another challenge that I think we should take on. Yeah, and that whole idea, the gold water nickel, I mean, it's, it's every, it, it seems to run in cycles that Whenever you get into discussions about the whole of government united uh, behind a, a, a challenge or a threat, it's how do you get there? How do you bring them along? 
and uh, all of your discussion about setting the theater. I mean, uh, when you talk about you know that coordination, that level of coordination, uh, you know the complexity, the bureaucracy of a big nation like our own. How do you avoid the operational paralysis or the strategic paralysis that is the target of any adversary on us to do that? And uh, it's like I say, we hear that this hey, we need a Goldwater Nichols like to bring the government agencies together in, in one cogent manner. But thank you. Thank you, sir. Won't be automatic. Sir, please. All right, hey, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Colonel Clark, Sabo Commander. Um, uh, and this is definitely for uh, Major. Uh, Kobrick, but uh, anybody can uh, can chime in. Um, so I'm kind of interested in specifics of what setting the theater might look like in terms of concepts. And the reason I ask this is because, at least from my own personal observations, and you know, uh, is that there's a lot of times a lack of imagination, and very much uh, it's the human nature to avoid the black swan, and that applies to everyone, you know, from the colonel level up to the four star, and and to the national command authority. You know, oftentimes folks don't want to envision what the worst possible scenario could be and then therefore don't uh, kind of plan against it. So just three things that, that kind of occurred to me is one, you know, where is the plan for integrated air and missile defense? Yeah, it could be very expensive, right? But where is the uh, concept for integrated air and missile defense of our cities and critical infrastructure? I think it's the kind of thing that the American people think we probably do, but as we probably saw in all 9-11, we don't. Um, second, uh, title, title 32 is the National Guard. Title 10, Section 246, designates the militia into two classes. One, the organized, the guard, Title 32. The other, the unorganized, all able-bodied males from 17 to 45 uh, in the United States. Uh, so you know, that authority is there in Title 10. It's not a Title 32 authority. Um, that seems to me to be North, uh, Army North's authority right there. And what is Army North looking at in terms of leveraging or setting up programs to, uh, you know, in, in a worst case scenario environment to call up uh, the unorganized militia uh, in defense of the homeland. And then third, uh, the NDAA of 96 basically abolished the Army's Directorate of Civilian Marksmanship uh, and spun it off as a nonprofit uh, corporation. Uh, currently, the um, Civilian Marksmanship Program cooperates with the U United States Army Marksmanship Unit on competitive activities, but otherwise is not a resource for the Army. And that kind of goes back to the second question about uh, the unorganized militia. You know, um, it's certainly a political question, but if we're not, tr if we don't have any sort of mechanism to bring the unorganized militia on board and train them, how are we going to leverage them in a worst case scenario? Over. Lucy, you want to start that? Yes, I'm, I'm <laughs> just uh, capturing that here. Okay, so I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> um, Okay, so with the, the recency there uh, first. Um, okay, so guard uh, or, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say un unorganized militia because a, a vast majority of Army North's resources are um, assigned guard resources, right? So they do get exercised. Um, it's just that we have to activate them to do so. So they're most frequently rec um, exercised during DISCA. No, I specifically mean the unorganized militia. I'm not okay. talking about all right, Un unorganized about. militia. Unorganized militia, all able-bodied males, not in the active duty army or the National Guard. So yeah. my brother, who's... So there are state militias. Right. And there are states, the New York Guard, in fact, has a... When you sure. ask the New York Guard, they have the New York Military Department because they have both an army militia as well as a naval militia. And so not every state has them, but uh, th there are militias that are somewhat organized, but they are not Title 32 and they're under state authority. Okay. And I think the tension that you raise is something that we talked in the JFLIC course just a couple of weeks ago, and, and that is, you know, we still have a tension between the federal government and the Constitution and sovereignty and state rights. And, and I think you're gonna find it very hard pressed for the federal government to exercise the Constitution to go to your unorganized militia and say we're going to pull up these forces and we're going to bring them into these states in response to these to a catastrophe or disaster or whatever that, that tension is just not mm -hmm. that's a hard nut to crack and I think that's a well beyond kind of the where we are kind of trying to talk about strategic land power and how that's going to happen in a disaster in the homeland because 
there are mechanisms in place and you've identified some really great you know kind of opportunities mm -hmm. but uh you know it's not at the r north level to figure out how are we going to get you know activating marksmanship programs and and unregulated militia i mean that's that's that, that's at the northcom level and and at the at the you know the department level within the department of agencies i think the greater question which i would put to you is how are we engaging the private sector that owns the critical infrastructure that we need to power project, right? Mm -hmm. What are we doing with the rail industry to talk about, I mean, they're moving our divisions, <laughs> right? To the ports, to get, them, you know, to get them on the ships. That's all done by rail. What are we doing with the rail industry, right? Mm -hmm. What are we doing with the critical, the, the energy in infrastructure, right? The, the Edison Institute and the FERCs to understand the power grid and how the power grid operates and the Corps of Engineers that operates some of the dams, not all of the dams in the power system. How are we understanding the impacts of cyber on that sector? What are we doing in the banking industry to make sure that there's money flowing when all the shit hits the fan and the power goes out and we can't get to the money system and how does that impact our ability to power project those are the really i think hard questions to get to more than you know are we going to sorry to but dominate the, <laughs> the discussion here but to go to the well are we going to use you know some irregular militia out there when we've got these kind of at the state level it is the state rights and state sovereignty and some of the adjutant generals will are very adamant about Title X will not come into my state without having dual status commander. Sorry, I, I no, totally tied No, I appreciate it, sir. Very, very hopeful. <laughs> no, that's very helpful, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so to, to get then to, to the question about the private sector piece, I mean, it's challenging without uh, violating OPSEC here. Um, so we, we do certainly analyze critical infrastructure um, and prioritize that. And, and there's more critical infrastructure than Army North can protect and defend. Um, so um, so there's, there's a lot of analysis that goes into that and there's a lot of challenges that come with it, not just because um, you know, we're stepping outside of our authority, we can't just impose kind of the security standards we would like, but because even so far as, as, as communications between um, our, our different platforms and, and systems go and, and what we're allowed to share um, impacts how, how the private sector will respond to our security needs. Um, so there, it's, it's just fraught with challenges for sure. Um, but, but I think that speaks also to, to Colonel Clark's earlier question about you know, protecting the critical infrastructure that certainly there, there are, that is an integral part of our plans. Um, and just, it, it gets back to the fact that we have to stress these plans um, in, in the exercises that we've been conducting. We've been trying to kind of see where the, the points of failure might be. Um, and I don't think we've, we've gotten there yet in, in really seeing um, how badly this will impact then not just defense of the homeland, but projecting forces. Um, but, but that is where Army North is right now in trying to exercise and find those points of failure and friction. I actually wanted to add on to that because of, uh, of what you said uh, and, and speaking to the, the ideas of these you know, unreg un unregulated militias and what you can mobilize in a crisis. So again, taking a lesson from Ukraine, uh, when I was there in August of 21, so a few months before the, the invasion, one of the NGOs I met was an anti-corruption, pro-democracy NGO. They were getting money from USAID and State Department to do their activities. Guess what happens in February 20 of 2022? They turned off their website and became partisans and went down to the front lines. And to this day, they're, they're still killing Russians. Now, what does this mean in a uh, actual crisis on the American homeland? This is why I would actually argue and contend that we need our J7s and all seven staffs to be thinking about how can you plug in and integrate into civil society and, and these networks uh, so that if you do have a gap or a seam that you cannot fill with a uniform body, can you identify a group of volunteers, a club, an NGO, et cetera, that has an interest in providing that to you 
for free because they're usually, in a crisis of conflict, there's usually lots of highly motivated individuals that want to do something and they don't care about getting paid. They just want to win and get through the conflict or the crisis. And I think that's one of those things, if you take anything out of the way, in my opinion, that would be how do you do that? You know, if it means the railways are basically going down, you don't have the people like to run it, it manually, guess what? Go down to your local Elks Lodge and see if there's any like retired people there that used to work there that have that baseline industrial age type of knowledge to make these things work without the internet anymore. Sam, please, sir. No, what a terrific, uh, terrific panel. Thank you all. Um, you know, j just as a public service, you know, to reach out, and, and Professor Tussie knows this, but we've been toying with the idea over the last half dozen years uh, of, a, of a war game, which, which we called Shadow of a Doubt, uh, to, to look to see could a determined adversary through information affect U.S. Army readiness and, and quantify that. Uh, so maybe, uh, teammate, we can, uh, we can talk about that further. My question is uh, for Lieutenant Colonel Witt. Uh, with, with the lack of Army and really DOD capabilities in the Arctic, um, and we've sort of ceded that, and we've said it's low priority, how does that affect, or does it, combatant commands plans and, and campaign plans? Uh, and is, in your research, is the Arctic key terrain? Thanks. I would argue that for, for the U.S., uh, Alaska is definitely key terrain uh, as far as the Arctic. Uh, the other Arctic nations will be key terrain just for power projection platforms that for if in the event the U.S. needs to go there, uh, we need to have those relationships with our Arctic partners in order to do that. Um, the unpreparedness for the COCOMs, again, I don't work, I have never worked at a, at a COCOM um, as to what their, their plans look like. Um, so what that readiness does, I mean, every COCOM in their posture statement has the Arctic at some level, if it wasn't this year, the previous year, as a priority. So that exists. Um, it's just slow to get movement and traction just because of funding and the other events that are going on in the world. So I'd say that the priority, the acknowledgement, the awareness exists. Um, it's just there are many competing priorities and funding that um, sort of inhibit the ability to do it and slow slow the movement towards being able to um, conduct that at that. That kind of answers that. Just as a footnote, you know, the Air National Guard, the 119th Air Wing New York National Guard, mm -hmm. is the only asset in the DOD inventory that has C-130s on skis and is, ski, mm -hmm. is kind of Arctic land. And they, they supply the uh, National Science Foundation in the Antarctica, and they go up to the uh, summit in Greenland. Uh, in the in the summer season, our, our summer season, but they're the, that's the only assets we have in the whole in the entire DoD inventory. And if I could just add on, um, certainly it is a priority for Army North to kind of deconflict what's going on there in Alaska. Um, as you said, it is a power projection platform for Indo-PACOM, but so those forces are assigned to Indo-PACOM. Uh, and, and so that means that while this is part of the homeland that is part of our defense prerogative, we would need to flow forces in while they're flowing forces out potentially. Um, and it, it, it's not hard to imagine how many friction points we will encounter in trying to exercise any of these tip fids. Um, so that is certainly one of our active priorities in deconflicting. So at the risk of uh, straining my friendship with Greg Cald Caldwell, I'd like to thank you all um, <laughs> For, for your your attention here, this is as as you might uh, imagine, this is a, this is a subject of growing importance, and and of personal uh, uh, passion uh, of my own. Uh, we need to continue to work these these areas, and we will, uh, as we as we right right towards the end of our discussion, we got on some fundamental challenges that we're facing here because we're doing things within the United States, um, and as you as you try to figure out how we go about addressing these issues. What, what's the role of government? What is the role of the four different levels of government that we talk about? I would suggest to you that uh, we're, we're going to have to look at this from the bottom up and from the top down, uh, not only within government, but within the private sector, within our communities, and so forth. And they will all be involved in the business of the military if the day should come uh, that, we, that the President of the United States cries havoc and lets loose the dogs of war within the territorial confines of the United States. The, government's re the federal government's responsibility is, without a doubt, to, to construct the strategies that we will need to address this as a nation. 
But as you all know, the strategies are just the things to hang things upon. And the supplemental strategies, the operational plans, the plans that will take place uh, within, the, uh, within the state governments, the plans that will take place within the, uh, within the communities of, of those state governments, uh, will need the direction that that, that, that that strategy will be laying out for us. So as first as soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and then as citizens, I would enjoin you all to not only think about this yourself, but begin a conversation uh, with, with your friends on the outside. Uh, this is not unthinkable anymore. And, and the more that we address ourselves directly to the issues, looking at this as a whole of society, uh, the more we will be prepared as opposed to having to react uh, if the dark day should come. Thank you once again for your, your attention. Bert, I want to, I appreciate uh, Bert Trussing's help here. And um, <laughs> the whole idea, we're talking about mission assurance. And, and we are going to talk more about homeland defense with some of the panels that we're going to have this afternoon. So we're not done talking about this. So there's opportunity to bring up your ideas if you haven't brought them up before. Homeland defense is number one, as we say. But what does that mean? You talked about Arctic challenges. You talked about national leadership re leading uh, solutions talked about some of the issues we have with uh, schisms and the whole divisive nature of a democracy. Authorities, rights, private sector, where does that fit in? Um, the whole idea that um, in 1861 through 1865, I think we uh, had some issues with state rights and uh, I thought we had that solved, but I guess we're still looking at some of those challenges with the federal government. And um, one of the things I'll bring back to history is we know we have historians on the board there was this whole Plattsburgh movement, this Plattsburgh uh, programs that around World War II to try to go ahead and get the country prepared to be more outdoorsy, to be more like a militia, and to be more um, ready for war, so to speak. But that was started by private citizens. That was rich folks that said, hey, let's have a camp up in Plattsburgh, New York, and let's have folks come and get prepared to be able to go ahead and uh, live like a soldier for a summer and uh, help prepare the nation to make them ready. So there's lots of things, but that was the private sector getting involved. And again, we get back to how are we gonna coordinate all this stuff. Bert clearly has covered a lot of water in this area. You can see by the panel he's developed, they've done a lot of research on this. I'm glad to know that the Arctic is cold and that we were able to determine that after our six months of research. <laughs> so thank you for that. But um, if you have more questions, you can see that clearly he's the expert and his panel has um, done a wonderful job. So please, let's give him a, a big strategic land power. Thank you.